is an historian of the Vietnam War who has written three books on the subject, including the most recent, published earlier this month, Triumph Regained. From 2018 to 2019, Dr. Moyer served as director of the Office of Civilian Military Cooperation at USAID and previously served as director of the Project on Military and Diplomatic History at the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington, D.C. He holds a BA summa cum laude from Harvard and a PhD from Cambridge. Dr. Moyer is the William P. Harris Chair in Military History at Hillsdale College, and it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Moyer for remarks on the Vietnam War and the Paris Peace Accords. Dr. Moyer. Thanks, Jim, for that great introduction. I appreciate the opportunity to speak here. Uh, I'm going to talk today uh, about broader issues of Vietnam historiography and talk a bit about Nixon himself and his role in what I'm covering. But the new book out, Triumph Regained, goes from 65 to 68. It's the sequel to the earlier book I wrote, Triumph Forsaken, which goes from 54 to 65. And now the last version will look at 69 to 75. And I spent about seven years on the first volume and then off and on worked on this uh, the new one for about 13 years. And so uh, just digging into the research on the Nixon period, I, I won't uh, attempt to get into debates with, with the great group that was, came before and is speaking afterwards. Because uh, the thing I've learned in this is until you really dig in to the documents, primary sources, most of what you heard is probably inaccurate. So premise of both of these books of mine is that um, the early versions of history were in many cases distorted either just because there was a lack of information or uh, people had partisan agendas. Now, you know, 50 years is often seen as kind of the time when we look back and say, well, we can take a, a more dispassionate approach. Uh, I think there's still a lot of passion in the subject, but uh, I think hopefully we can be a bit more objective in how we look at it. Now, in the books, I address what has been the the controversy between orthodox and revisionist views of the Vietnam War. Uh, there are some who would say, well, I think we can, we got to move beyond these labels and uh, those are a thing of the past. But I do think they're useful in staking out some of the ground. Now, I don't agree entirely with the revisionist perspective, but I think it's um, correct in many respects and it hasn't been fully covered by the academy. And, and for those who aren't familiar, you know, revisionist during the Cold War initially was the group that was uh, critical of the U.S. government for its conduct of the Cold War. But when we get to Vietnam and the much of the establishment shifts against the war, then then the anti-war, anti-administration faction becomes orthodox, and it's those later who come to defend, to a large degree, the administration are the the revisionists. The we'll talk very briefly through sort of the origins of the war, which I cover, and uh, some of you may know Nixon. President Nixon was very involved in some of the early discussions about Vietnam in 1954 with the Battle of Dien Bien Phu. He supports sending American troops to take the place of the French troops if the French are in trouble. The uh, President Eisenhower says no. Uh, in the uh, first of my books, which I'm going to just talk about very briefly, I do, uh, the title Triumph Forsaken, refers first and foremost to the coup of November 1963, when uh, South Vietnamese generals overthrew and assassinated President Nguyen Diem with uh, support from the United States. And at the time, uh, I think actually uh, Richard Nixon understood better than most what was going on. And he said in October of 63 that, uh, and I would quote that I would say the day that in Vietnam, the choice today is not between President Diem and somebody better. It is between Diem and, and someone infinitely worse, which 
as I argue that, go on to argue that 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 is spot on, and that in fact is this coup that leads to a rapid decline in the effectiveness of the South Vietnamese government, and will encourage North Vietnam to go from guerrilla war to conventional war. Uh, we also know that um, Nixon told Eisenhower on November 4th, just two days after the assassination, that uh, said our complicity in Ziem's murder was a national disgrace, which I also agree with. But at the time, a lot of people didn't really understand this, but he clearly did see that. So after Ziem, you have this revolving door of South Vietnamese governments, changes in power, and each of them purges people who they saw as being too loyal to the preceding regime. And this has a highly debilitating impact on the South Vietnamese government. In, uh, in 1964, in August, you have the Tonkin Gulf incidents where there's a North Vietnamese uh, naval attacks, naval attack, the second one, it seems doubtful it actually happened, but there's a perception of attack on the Americans. And uh, Lyndon Johnson decides to take a, a limited response based on uh, academic theories that that Robert McNamara had been giving him, and that is hoping to convince North Vietnamese that this is showing resolve, but in fact the opposite happens, and the North Vietnamese take it as a sign of weakness. And then Johnson reinforces that in 1964 during the election when he says, "We're not going to send American boys nine or ten thousand miles away from home to do what Asian boys ought to be doing for themselves." And when Nixon, or excuse me, when Johnson gets to the middle of '65, uh, the North Vietnamese invasion uh, is now in full bloom, and General Westmoreland saying country's about to fall. So Johnson takes a sober look at what's going on in Southeast Asia, and he subscribes to the domino theory, as did Richard Nixon and Dwight Eisenhower and, and most other serious statesmen of the time. Now, the domino theory will get maligned later on and after 1975 when the dominoes don't fall, most of them, the Cambodia falls and Khmer Rouge kills a couple million people, but most of the other dominoes in the region don't fall. It's argued that, uh, you know, the domino theory really wasn't valid and hence it was just foolish to be in Vietnam. But uh, I, I argue that the world changes fundamentally from 65 to 75. And this is particularly germane to uh, the Nixon period and the and the anniversary we're selling, settling, uh, celebrating today, because the strategic stakes are going to change uh, very dramatically. The now in the new book, I pick up with the American intervention in August of '65, and it's not long after that that we get to what is one of the most important events in the entire Cold War, one that gets ignored in many cases, and that is the Indonesian coup and counter coup of October 1965. In that episode, President Sukarno, who is in, in now in league with the Indonesian Communist Party, is decides he needs to destroy the leadership of the Indonesian military because they are seen as too hostile to the communists. So he orders that the leaders be rounded up, and they are. Some of them are killed, some are arrested, one escapes. But he neglects to arrest one critical general, that's General Saharto. And he thinks Saharto is an opportunist and will go whichever way uh, he sees things going. And to some extent, that's a proper an analysis because Saharto doesn't do anything at the beginning when he learns of this coup. He's near the uh, location where the where the coup is taking place. So what he does is he goes and surveys other generals in near the capital to see which way they are, are going to go. And enough of them say that they want to resist the communists, that that is ultimately the course he chooses to take. And in the book, I said a lot of evidence indicating that, in fact, the American stand in Vietnam is critical to this decision of the Indonesian military. I think had the United States bailed out in South Vietnam, the Indonesians would have seen that basically there's no hope that the Americans are going to help them resist communism. 
and they would have gone along with Sukarno. And President, future President Nixon is actually one of the first people to recognize this truth. And in his uh, famous Foreign Affairs article of October of 1967, he actually writes that um, the U.S. presence has provided tangible and highly visible proof that communism is not necessarily the wave of Asia's future. This was a vital factor in the turnaround in Indonesia. So then from there, I argue that uh, it, you know, China specialists looking at what happens next highlights the impact of two critical setbacks for China in late 1965. One is the American intervention in Vietnam, and the other is the uh, failure of Sukarno in Indonesia. So he had, at the beginning of 65, things were looking great for him. All of a sudden, these two big victories he's hoping for uh, fall out of his reach. And this then encourages him to shift away from foreign affairs to internal affairs and to look for enemies within. And this then pro uh, provokes the great proletarian cultural revolution, which will uh, devastate China's economy and its military. Several million people probably don't know the exact numbers, but a lot, a lot of people killed, including a lot of the society's elites. And uh, it will lead to a decline in support for other countries in the region. It will also, the Cultural Revolution and also Vietnam itself, lead to a widening of the Sino-Soviet split. The uh, Soviets are appalled by the Cultural Revolution, and they are competing with China for influence in North Vietnam. And as the U.S. air war builds up over North Vietnam, the Vietnamese increasingly look to the Soviets for help because the Soviets have anti-aircraft weaponry that China doesn't have. And the growing dependence of North Vietnam on the Soviets will cause uh, China to become increasingly skeptical and eventually hostile. And uh, so we see, because of these changing dynamics, because of Indonesia and also what we see, China losing its appetite for these international crusades and then the falling out between China and North Vietnam, that the strategic value of South Vietnam is declining from, from the point of view of the United States. It doesn't go to zero at any point, I don't think. But, but this is certainly something that I think is weighing on the minds of Nixon and Kissinger and others in the United States as events proceed in the early 70s. Now, during the period, the, the latter part of the Johnson administration, one of the biggest disputes, which I cover in detail, is over the question of expanding the war. The Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, President Eisenhower, and other hawks, including uh, Richard Nixon, are arguing that under the parameters set by President Johnson, there's no way really to achieve a decisive end because you're just fighting in South Vietnam, you allow the North Vietnamese to keep sending troops indefinitely into the country. So no matter how many of you kill, there's gonna be more, the war could go on. And they, they wanna, in particular, cut the Ho Chi Minh Trail in Laos. There's a lot of pressure to step up the bombing of the North Operation Rolling Thunder and the belief that the gradual escalation policy of Robert McNamara has not been sufficient. But for most of this period, Johnson is still under the spell of McNamara, and McNamara has a lot of reasons why he opposes these uh, methods of escalation and arguing that they're not going to work, that they're going to provoke Chinese and Soviet intervention in particular. Now, we have, with the wisdom of 50 years and as more information has come out, we have a much better idea of how to assess these alternative options. And we know from both the Soviets and the Chinese that, in fact, they were not interested in intervening militarily directly in Vietnam, they had their own problems to deal with. The Chinese had gotten burned in Korea, and they didn't want any part of that. So the, there were a lot of missed opportunities on the U.S. part, 
because of uh, false fears of the enemy. Now, President Nixon will himself, in each of these cases, at some point in his presidency, take action. The uh, the incursion to Cambodia in 1970, sending the South Vietnamese and Laos since 1971, and um, escalating the bombing in 1972. There is one point I found, one of the more, more interesting things that I had no idea about is that in 1967, there is a point where the North Vietnamese appear to be on the brink of submission because Johnson has temporarily authorized new strikes in North Vietnam and North Vietnam, the city of Hanoi is on the brink of starvation because of the damage to their infrastructure. But Johnson will end up backing off and he doesn't really um, understand what's going on, the depth of the problems there. And so this will be another missed opportunity. So Lyndon Johnson in March of 1968 goes on the air to announce that he is not going to run again for president and that he's going to stop bombing parts of the North for a while. And this is often taken as evidence that basically the United States has begun to check out of the war. And this is uh, another, I think, critical misperception, which is also important in understanding how the war transitions to the Nixon presidency. But uh, Johnson does not actually really plan to de-escalate in the North. And the areas he stops bombing at this point in time are actually areas that, where the weather is so bad that you couldn't bomb much anyway. And we'll see to the end of his presidency, he will not reduce the US troop level and he will continue to, uh, to keep up the military pressure in the South. In the second part, well, starting in May of 1968, there's two more big North Vietnamese offensives. They call them the second and third wave, first wave being the Tet Offensive of 1968, which had gone horribly wrong. The second and third wave are not as well known, but in the book, I have made use of a lot of North Vietnamese sources from Merle Pribino, who some of the other people on this program have also benefited from. But th these North Vietnamese sources indicate clearly that these two second, the second and third wave offensives were even more devastating to them than the first because they basically tried the same thing, which was attacking the cities. And this time they didn't even have the element of surprise. And so the Americans, South Vietnamese are just there waiting to, to crush them. And so this will, uh, at the end of the third wave, uh, this will pave the way for an expansion of the pacification program and will leave the uh, incoming President Nixon with, with a much more favorable environment within the South. And I argue that um, the it's really this change in the military situation that leads to a fundamental change in the American way to the war. I think there's sometimes a uh, an argument that General Abrams, when he comes in in 68, changes things just be based on philosophical differences, but he actually keeps things more or less the same until the third wave offensive has been crushed. And so in November of 68, we get to the accelerated pacification campaign uh, where the South Vietnamese government starts going very rapidly into a number of villages where it had not been for a long time and, and with considerable success. When we get towards the end of 68, I also found, sort of startled to find information on public opinion that seemed to contradict what we generally had thought. People who've read about the war are probably familiar with a chart that shows over time and the answer to the question, do you think the U.S. made a mistake sending, sending troops to fight in Vietnam? And in 1968, uh, for the first time, you see more Americans are saying it was a mistake than it was not a mistake. And so this has been interpreted as proof that, aha, see, now the American people in 1968 have lost hope in the war. They're ready to, to give up. Well, that turns out not to be the case. It turns out that there are a lot of people who think it was a mistake, and we don't know why necessarily why they thought it, but thought it was a mistake, but they think we should still keep fighting there. And you know, a lot of these people are hawks who thought it was a mistake, probably because of how the administration handled it. They didn't like how it had been handled. 
we have uh, there's two polls from late 68 about U.S. policy and what people think should be done. And one of them says, uh, uh, and this is in October of 68, how many how many Americans want to get out of Vietnam entirely? It's only 13 percent. And there's the other poll that's taken in this time period is about 19 percent. So less than one out of five Americans are actually at the end of 1968, advocating that the U.S. just get out of Vietnam, which is very different from how we often perceive this period. One of the most interesting aspects of this enduring support, too, is the fact that you never really have a president who is selling the war to the American people in the way that other presidents have done. And Lyndon Johnson will admit to this in some candid conversations and he says at one point, if history indicts us for Vietnam, it will be for fighting a war without trying to stir up patriotism. And so it's especially remarkable that you have this ongoing support for a war. And I think it it's a reflection of American culture, that Americans recognize the importance of perseverance. They recognize the damage you could incur if you go help a nation and then just bail out on your allies very quickly when things go south. And there's also a general recognition that there is a global struggle with communism that's going on and that uh, the United States needs to prevail ultimately in this struggle. Uh, you can also see interesting signs of the public mood from the presidential race, the, the, the uh, contest between Richard Nixon and Hubert Humphrey. And when you get to the Chicago Convention in August of 1968, the Democratic Convention, Humphrey is being urged by the liberal wing of the Democratic Party to adopt a dovish plank, which involves quickly pulling the United States out of Vietnam, forming a coalition government between communist and non-communist elements, the same sort of coalition government that had failed miserably in, in Czechoslovakia and Poland and elsewhere. But Humphrey decides he's not going to go with that liberal plank, even that he himself is fairly liberal. But the party's moderates and conservatives do not like this liberal plank. They are among those who want to stick it out. And so it's indication of the support for the ongoing support for the war that Humphrey ends up rejecting the liberal plank and going with a, a more centrist policy, which um, involves continuing continued American participation in Vietnam. And then he, he gives a famous speech at Salt Lake City in October, which is an attempt to close what's a very large, large gap with Richard Nixon. And uh, so he talks about ha being more accommodating in negotiations, but he still, uh, at the end, it says that we are not going to withdraw from Vietnam. He's still concerned about all of these moderate and conservative Democrats and other voters who are not on board with the idea of pulling the plug on mm -hmm. Vietnam. Now, Nixon himself, during the campaign, he is also a very interested in courting moderate voters. And he's in a pretty good position to do this because he's already built up this reputation as a staunch anti-communist. And so he can afford to make some more than Humphrey, really, than to, to make some talk of, of negotiating a peace without seeming too soft. And he does oftentimes try to avoid committing himself too much to any one initiative. Uh, and he, he will say on a number of occasions that preserving South Vietnam is essential to our security. Uh, but he doesn't talk as much as before about harsher, stronger uh, measures of escalation. And he does, you know, at one point he's asked by a journalist if he has a secret plan to end the war. And turns out he didn't say that, but a news reporter somehow just decided he did. And so we have this uh, myth out there that he promised to have a secret plan. And, uh, and so usually alleged that this was sort of uh, a falsehood because he didn't actually have a secret plan. Well, he does, I think the record shows, indicate that he had something, elements of a plan. It wasn't a highly concrete plan, but it included 
strengthening the South Vietnamese armed forces and increasing American military pressure while seeking a diplomatic solution. And, and to do that, he was going to put pressure on the Soviets and the Chinese to, to pressure the North Vietnamese. And he also talks about threatening the North Vietnamese with devastation as a means of getting them to go along. And it seemed that he was expecting that he could achieve this sort of diplomatic settlement within his first year in office. One other thing I want to mention briefly about the 1968 election, this is covered near the end of the book, there is the longstanding uh, assessment or allegation that the Nixon administra Nixon candidacy campaign con uh, colluded with Madame Cheneau to throw the election and that uh, Cheneau and Nixon convinced President Chu to avoid getting into peace negotiations simply uh, by, by um, through underhanded promises and so forth. And, um, you know, after looking at this, you know, it's it's very clear that um, Chu did not, in fact, need any of this pressure or cajoling from Cheneau or Nixon. Uh, he knew early on that Humphrey was a bit tepid towards his government and the cause, and he knew that Nixon would be tougher and more supportive of South Vietnam. And so he does face this choice on negotiations that could influence the election and Q um, you know, has to make a decision. And he does decide to uh, abstain from the, the negotiations, which will help Nixon get elected. But there is no, uh, it's just no reason to believe that either Nixon or Cheneau had any influence because again, Q already knew that it would be better for him if Nixon won. The, uh, you know, in the, one other piece of evidence just about the prevalence of support for the war is in the final vote, Humphrey gets less than 43% of the vote, uh, whereas the rest goes to Nixon and then to Wallace, who uh, Wallace is even more hawkish on the war than Nixon. And when we get to the end of 68, you see jubilation among the South Vietnamese and among many Americans about Nixon's election because they conclude that this is going to lead to a tougher, tougher policies in the war. And the North Vietnamese, by contrast, are now very discouraged because they are convinced that Nixon is going to be tougher than, uh, than, than uh, Johnson had been. Uh, the last point I just leave you with is that um, when we think of the long-term perspective that uh, we did you know, the U.S. does end up saving most of the dominoes. It doesn't save South Vietnam. When you look at what happens in the rest of the region, the countries that the U.S. does end up saving, South Korea and Taiwan in, in these internal struggles, they are now today two of the, the most uh, prosperous nations in the world, whereas China and North Korea are two of the, the least free, and they're, uh, in comparison, not as prosperous. And Vietnam, I think the same goes for Vietnam. So I think the tragic legacy is that there is not today a South Vietnam, and as I think there certainly could have been a South Vietnam that would look a lot like South Korea today. So thank you very much. Uh, enjoyed the opportunity to uh, speak with you both. Thank you, Dr. Moore.